Heading back to Indiana after the lovely wedding of a childhood friend, I'd stopped at my parents' place and gotten a little sleep and was ready to drive through the night just the way I like it. And I do like it. At 3 a.m., it's basically just me and the truck drivers who are superheroes of the highway. When they aren't surrounded by absolute idiots, truck drivers can do miraculous up to and including driving in their sleep. It's only an issue when they're trying to negotiate the road against the self-involved tools who see the long line of cars leading up to construction merge, speed past the line, and nose in at the choke point. When you put those monsters on the road, no driver can perfectly control an 80,000 pound battering ram. I actually think that every year all tractor trailer drivers should just be able to roll straight over a car that cuts them off. They just call in the mile marker and they're on their radio and keep rolling. So anyway, in the pitch black hours of the morning, somewhere around 5 a.m., I'm on a desolate stretch of Route 30 when a deer decides it would like to visit Indiana and wants me to give it a ride. Without thumbs for hitchhiking or a solid command of the English language to shout his requests, he apparently decides that the next best thing would be jumping on the hood of my car. Pro tip, jumping on a car is actually the worst way to hitch a friendly ride. Instead, we had a brief unpleasant encounter in which the deer crushed the passenger side of my hood and didn't get a ride to Indiana. Thanks partly to my lightning reflexes and the fact that the deer was crazy good at jumping, the deer was hit a glancing blow and it leapt back into the darkness, ostensibly none the worse for wear which didn't seem entirely fair considering the state of my car. And now that I think about it, maybe the deer was part of an elite squad designed to combat human expansion. Well, luckily I survived, and despite having a hood folded up on one side, the car kept running, and after a brief exam, I even decided I could keep driving. The thing about hitting your first deer is, even if the deer scampers off completely unfazed, bordering on uninterested, you feel like you're supposed to do something, report it, call your insurance guy, or if you know as much about cards as I, have somebody else look at it in case you're one pothole away from a fiery death. So I'm coasting along, weighing whether to call the highway patrol and looking for a gas station that's open before the sun comes up in the middle of nowhere. And as I'm weighing my re imagined responsibility against my desire to get home before my car blows up, as is my totally justifiable fear, I pass a cop car on the side of the road. I swerve onto the side of this country highway to both find out if there is a duty of reporting and, if so, fulfill said duty. In an effort to minimize the jostling of the explodey bits of the car, I very gingerly apply the brake. The result was that I end up somewhere between 20 and 50 yards from away from the patrol, patrol car. I brace for the blinding brightness of the police spotlight in my rearview mirror with my license, registration, and proof of insurance handy, just in case. As I wait there with my hands high and visible on the steering wheel, absolutely nothing happens. A minute or two ticks by and I realize that occasionally departments will leave unoccupied squad cars on the road to discourage speeders. I could be very well waiting to be aided by an empty car, and since the world hasn't given us kit, I should address that possibility, so I get out of the car. I start walking to the patrol car with my hands far enough away from my body as to eliminate all possibility of misunderstanding because I don't want to be a statistic, when suddenly a number of important but previously unrelated pieces of data all come together to ruin my morning just a little bit more. The first, that I'm a 30 year old black man which tends to make my experiences with the police tense. Not gun out, shouty tense, but pulled over, doing 67 and a 65, uh, are you sitting on this bench for a reason, may I see your ID, uh, and will you submit to a search of your vehicle tense. Amazingly enough, tense and not fun. The second, in this country, in the country, uh, there is a concern that the person with the badge and I have slightly different uh, ideas about the phrases serve and protect, reasonable force, or whether the correct side won the Civil War. And there will be no way to find this out until it's too late to address that in a mutually beneficial way. 
There's always a debate staggering along in various degrees of intensity about the appropriate place for the banner erroneously identified as the Stars and Bars in the contemporary world. South Carolina removed the Confederate battle flag from its state, ground, state house grounds in 2015. But there's a significant contingent of America clinging to that icon with the same tenacity they reserve for misogyny and the right to brandish AR-15s. Now, there are a lot of well-meaning people trying to eliminate the so-called rebel flag as a regressive symbol of hate well past its expiration date. I take a different approach. If I owned a store, in addition to whatever I actually marketed, I would sell rebel flag everything. Bumper stickers, pens, hats, phone covers, belts, buckles, jackets, watches, and holsters. I would offer free battle flag lapel pins with every purchase. And my idea is awesome. It's the realization of everyone's secret wish that people will all wear their baggage and nonsense like a label. Instantly you know, wow, this isn't gonna work. Cause let's say that 98% of the cops are entirely adapted to life in this modern world. In that case, there are 2% of the people with a badge and a gun trying to make America great in their own special way. And if they were wearing a classy lapel pin, then I know that my only job in this encounter is to not give them an excuse. Adding another fun layer to this Tower of Terror is the realization number three. It's 5.15 in the morning, and there's a cop in that car that maybe just fell asleep at his job, as so many of us pulling overnight shifts have done, and a face peeking into his window startling him awake could result in a potentially fatal misunderstanding, racial terror aside. My fourth, and probably biggest problem, is that with a forest on one side of the highway and a massive field on the other, no one might ever figure out where I went after that wedding ended. So, when I finished realizing all of these things, I was almost exactly halfway between my car and what I'd concluded was a sleeping cop, and trapped. Yes, trapped now, because I'm not 100% sure I want to turn around and walk back to my car, because in the dark of night, walking away can look like fleeing, and once again, I really don't want to be a statistic. I could call the department and find out if there's a person in the mystery car, but I neglected to grab my cell phone off of the mount in my car where it was doing double duty as a navigation device. I turned my wrist and glanced down at my watch. 5.20 a.m., so about 40, 45 minutes to sunrise. Yep, I can totally stand here that long. The cop did wake up about five minutes later. Uh, he didn't shoot me or tase me, which I consider a win. Uh, he didn't aid me with his lights in inspecting my car. He did promise to confirm the area clear of deer and sped off. In part, I think, to abet the shame of essentially being caught asleep at the radar gun. But hey, not a bullet, right? 